Thank you very much, Hao, for the kind invitation. I was really delighted when uh, you invited me, and especially delighted since my current group has numerous students that have either a pure mathematics, applied mathematics, or statistics background. And you see here in pink are the students that have had in the either an undergraduate in pure math, applied math, or statistics. So you can see that more than half of our group comes from this uh, mathematics background. So I hope to um, really inspire a few more uh, students to, to, to join us. Today I'm going to talk about the research of a few of the students highlighted here in purple. Uh, their names are uh, highlighted in purple, Christophe, Hao, Sam, and Xiaoji. In the past few years, we have seen significant advances in AI with the emergence of generative AI, ChatGPT, as well as uh, in robotics. And we have seen enormous leaps in AI. And yet, my question to many of, of you especially the ones that work in machine learning, is whether AI has indeed transformed healthcare systems. For instance, has AI fixed issues with NHS in the UK or enable us to control exorbitant costs of US healthcare? Can we um, prevent traffic jams from happening or can we solve the energy crisis? And as an educator, I often imagine a Roman schoolmaster, somebody entering today and in one of our classrooms and comparing um, our classrooms with those in Roman times. And my guess is that people would realize it. It's not that much that has changed in 2000 years. I also believe that we are not just a few breakthroughs away in solving these world challenges. Note that I'm not saying that machine learning and AI cannot solve these challenges or cannot play a role, an important role in many of these real world domains. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to think fundamentally differently about machine learning and AI and orient it towards the complexities of the real world. And this is indeed uh, what I have tried to do in my lab over the past 20 years since I became an academic. Recently, I work on medicine, healthcare, and education, but over the past 20 years, I've worked in many other areas, including networking, energy grids, transportation, smart cities, finance, economics. And I really believe that solving these complex human-centric problems is our biggest task as AI and machine learning researchers. And as I mentioned, I believe that fundamentally new paradigm is needed if it is to really solve complex real-world challenges using AI. And for that, I have recently, around one year ago, written a um, manifesto, which I call the case for reality-centric AI. You can find this manifesto on our website, and it outlines a um, seven-step uh, agenda to really uh, think differently about how to build machine learning models and how to think about the real world. I hope you are going to take a look at it and engage with it. It can be found on our website and also at the QR code here. A brief summary about reality-centric AI is that is building AI to solve real world problems, which operate effectively and accountably given the inherent and unavoidable complexities of the real world, and building AI which empowers rather than marginalize or replace humans. And what's really important at the core of this agenda is that we move from the current toy problems that we are often solving using AI, where we are taking a given benchmark and we are trying to really beat the current state of that, but rather go and look at complex real world problems, their complexities, and also the complexities inherent in the data, as well as in modeling these complex environments and building AI that can really uh, achieve powerful transformation. One important uh, aspect of this is the notion of time. 
If you look at a lot of the work that happens today in the top conferences in machine learning um, and artificial intelligence, you will see that we still focus a lot on static data. But the reality is that almost everything in the real world is a dynamic time series um, evolving system. And hence, it is time that we really need to focus much more on rather than the static data sets that are currently the workhorse of machine learning. But if it is to do so, we also need to realize that this requires new ways of thinking for the machine learning researchers. At the first glance, you may say, what is Mihaela really talking about, since we have numerous dynamic and recurrent models? And you see here a few examples, inclusively the very powerful transformers, which are the workhorse of large language models and many other scenarios. Also in our own lab over many decades, we built hidden Markov models, hidden semi-Markov models, and more recently, around seven, eight years ago, generalization of such models that are blends that um, really bring together the strength of recurrent neural networks with the strengths of hidden Markov models, uh, generalizing um, variable order Markov models, hidden Markov models. And this is the attentive state space models. But such um, beautiful deep learning methods are not solving the various um, reality-centric problems that we would like to address. And the reason is twofold. First, many of these models remain um, opaque. And in order for humans to use them uh, in order to understand forecasts, we need interpretability and uncertainty estimation to provide understanding and trustworthiness for human users. Also, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the very beginning of the talk, but then rapidly I will move towards going beyond time series forecasting into understanding and action. And in particular, I'm going to talk about complex dynamical systems where the focus is on modeling and simulation, system identification from data, control and optimization, and causal discovery of complex dynamical systems. And while many of my applications will come from the healthcare domain, please keep in mind that these tools are by no means only focused on healthcare. They are useful for energy, finance, transportation, smart cities, climate, and many other um, real world domains. Let's talk briefly about understanding time series forecasting. Many of the deep learning methods that we described before are opaque. They are not transparent. And a few years back in our lab, we were the first to develop explainable AI for time series data. And we developed two different methods, Dynamask and Simplex. Dynamask is powerful because it was the first feature-based attribution method for time series data, where we can turn a black box model for time series into a model for which we understand post hoc, which features were important over time. Uh, and Simplex um, was um, another first of its kind because it was able to provide both example and feature-based explanations jointly. And it was able to do so for any type of modality, including time series. So these are um, early advances of taking these black box time series forecasting models that were developed in the machine learning literature and made them somewhat um, transparent through post hoc explanations. By post hoc explanations, again, I'm talking about models that have been trained. And then after they have been trained, we are trying to understand how they make the predictions that they are making. But the reality is that in many high stakes scenarios, for instance, in healthcare, but also in finance, criminal justice, and many other domains, we need models that are transparent by design. And we do have methods that are transparent by design. You see a few examples here, but they are focusing on static predictions. For time series prediction, we do not have such transparent, model, transparent models. So ideally, we would like to develop such methods. 
And this is what we recently do, we did in a paper called Time View, which is a recent paper accepted at iClear, um, where we built time series interpretable models with effective visualization. We take data that contains static, static features as well as time series data. And in time view, we are able to both issue transparent predictions and also visualization associated with that. How do we do that? We do that using motifs, which describes part of a time series trend. For instance, as shown in here, increasing and strictly convex, for instance, or a straight line with zero slope. And um, we have associated with it uh, points and their coordinates, which can be mapped to the properties of a trend. And dynamic motifs encode information about the trajectories, first and second derivative, for instance. Then um, what we have is this transition points, which are points between the motifs, which we also, also call transition points. And these are coordinates that can be mapped to the properties of a trend. And these transition points uh, between these motifs correspond to local minima, maxima, inflection points. And these are exact properties used in standard mathematical exercises of function sketching, whose goal is to precisely understand the function. And we formalize the notion of a trend by defining the composition of a trajectory. So you see here how using the different motifs and transition points, we are uh, composing a trajectory. We have clear mathematical objects associated with these concepts, trends, part of a trend, properties of a trend. And in time view, we are using all this to create a first fully interpretable uh, time series model for time series forecasting. I will not talk about this today, but I just wanted to highlight it that Significant advances have been recently made by combining powerful mathematics with powerful machine learning to do transparent time series forecasting, thereby enabling human decision makers to derive actionable intelligence. Another important issue associated with the area of time series forecasting is uncertainty estimation. And while deep learning models achieve high predictive accuracy across broad range of tasks, Rigorously quantifying predictive uncertainty remains challenging. And in many domains, um, using Bayesian credible intervals is not enough. So methods such as, for instance, uh, Monte Carlo dropout are not useful. And the reason they are not useful is because we need usable estimates of predicting uncertainty, which should provide, which should cover the two prediction associated um, targets with high probability. And also we should have discrimination, both high and low confidence prediction instances. So in other words, what we need is frequentist uncertainty estimation associated with our time series prediction. And um, Bayesian intervals do not guarantee frequentist coverage um, and approximate posterior inference undermines discriminative accuracy very frequently. So how to do deal with that? We adopted and um, extended um, ideas that originate in mathematics and statistics, such as jackknife, for enabling us to do uncertainty estimation over time, of time series prediction over time, in the form of this ICML paper, um, of a few years back called discriminative jackknife. So in this paper, we develop this uh, method, discriminative jackknife, which is a frequentist procedure that utilizes influence functions of a model's loss functional who, to construct a jackknife or leave one out estimator of a predictive confidence interval. And this discriminative jackknife fulfills the desiderata that I mentioned before it's applicable to a wide range of deep learning methods. It is applicable post hoc without interfering with the model training. And it provides both discrimination as well as coverage. However, this is of relatively high complexity. So this is 
later we developed a conformal prediction methods for time series forecasting. And this has the advantage that the complexity is significantly reduced while providing many of the benefits that discriminative jackknife has, which is the fact that we can apply it post hoc after a model has been trained and can provide both discrimination and uh, good coverage. So this brings you very fast to a journey of making um, machine learning not only high accuracy, but also interpretable and trustworthy by combining ideas again from machine learning with ideas from mathematics. But what I'm most excited about and what I'll focus most of the talk today is really looking at complex dynamical systems through modeling, system identification, control optimization, and causal discovery. And once again, while examples come from healthcare, they are applicable to other areas as well. We all know in this uh, audience that dynamical systems are often modeled using differential equations that describe how the state changes over time. And we often use ordinal differential equations to describe them. But learning ordinal differential equations from data in a transparent way, it's a hard problem. So what I'm going to discuss first is how can we use a data set of time series trajectory? And how, can, how did we develop machine learning methods that use this data to learn transparent dynamical systems provide thereby structural knowledge to scientific researchers from a variety of fields, providing them with additional insight that can be gathered from data. So what we have as input is um, di are different types of trajectories of a system that is sampled over time, and our goal is to uh, discover a transparent systems of ODs from um, this data. The reason this is very challenging is that the time derivative is not observed, and we only observe the state over time. So conventional symbolic regression methods are not applicable. It is also difficult to estimate the time derivative because states are observed sporadically with noise, and Naive two-step symbolic regression, as I'm going to show to you later, often fails. Also, even opaque methods such as neural ODEs have a hard problem in many settings because um, really um, inferring the initial condition is often complex and the true condition of the system is unknown. So often methods that exist, even opaque methods like neural ODEs are sensitive to this initial condition. And this is computationally challenging. So what we did a few years back was to develop this method called DECODE, and this is work with Zhao Ji and Christophe, two brilliant PhD students in my lab. Um, we developed the code to discover closed form ordinal differential equations from these observed trajectories. How did we do it? We did it by um, using powerful ideas from mathematics. And in particular, we used the variational formulation of ODs in order to be able to solve this problem. To understand how and why the code works, we need to briefly remind ourselves with the variational formulation of ODEs. And a powerful thing about this is that this type of formulation enables us to characterize an ODE without referring to the derivative. So this is achieved by introducing this special, this special functional that takes the function f, the trajectory x, and the so-called testing function g, which we can design, and the value of this functional is the sum of these two integrals. And the important here, the important thing to notice here is that this expression does not involve the derivative of x, but rather the derivative of g. And g is something we can design. So we can design it in a way in which the derivative is easy to compute. And then this enables us to calculate the whole functional in an easy way. 
The variational formulation of ODs now states that the differential um, equations hold if and only if the corresponding functionals are zero for all the testing functions that are continuously differentiable and vanishing at endpoints. And this is why this function is a core, this function is a core element of our objective. And we expect that minimizing the value of this functional should correspond to finding better approximations of the true ODs. In our paper, um, we have formalized this very rigorously and we have a theorem associated with it. Um, I'll just briefly highlight the theorem here. But the reason I wanted to highlight it is that this is not just decorative math. Um, it is very powerful in enabling us to build a powerful machine learning algorithm in order to discover this ODs from data. So this formal proof uh, is wonderful, but what is even more interesting is that this provides us a theoretical justification of our algorithm, our machine learning algorithm. And this, this theorem guides us in the choice of testing functions which should be um, functions that form a Hilbert basis um, for the L2 space as highlighting here that are continuously differentiable and vanishing at endpoints. And one particular choice is the Fourier sign basis, which for me as a mathematical engineer is a very satisfying one because we often like um, Fourier basis in our uh, engineering work. This is not the only choice, but this is one possible choice. With this in mind, I can now describe our algorithm decode, which has two steps, the preprocessing step and the optimization step. And in preprocessing, we take the, the data set of observed trajectories and we denoise them and interpolate them to get estimated trajectories. And note that we estimate the trajectories in this case and not the derivatives. So hence, um, our framework um, um, is really quite powerful because we don't need to deal with the derivatives. And our framework is agnostic to the exact type of smoothing algorithm. And um, for instance, this can be chosen on the basis of the application or some domain knowledge. And uh, then in the second step, we do our optimization, which consists of the functional that we defined earlier which is now evaluated on all estimated trajectories from the first step and all the pre-specified testing function that I mentioned before. And the actual optimization can be done now by any algorithm, including a symbolic regression algorithm. Now, um, we compare this in our paper very thoroughly with um, a variety of two-step symbolic regression methods which are the only uh, other methods that, that are able to solve this problem in a transparent way. And what we did is we generated data from a variety of dynamical systems. Uh, here are just a few examples. And we try to rediscover from data the underlying dynamical system. And we chose, for instance, quite a lot of examples that are very common in medicine, for instance, asymmetric growth with saturation. And what you see is that the code um, significantly outperforms the benchmarks, especially in scenarios of interest, when we don't have a lot of samples, when um, we are varying the step size, and when we have quite a lot of noise. So this is very encouraging. What's interesting is the code significantly outperforms not only symbolic regression, but also models such as neural ODs which struggle in many settings, such as settings uh, where we have chaotic systems, non-periodic systems, and so on. Um, and this is, um, again, um, not surprising, even the fact that we do not, th these methods um, struggle when we need to um, do the, to solve the inverse value problem. Now, let's see a scenario where we do not know what we are about to discover. We do discovery from data, and this is the most exciting part. We see here, for instance, uh, the temporal effect of chemotherapy on tumor volume. 
And what you see is that often when we give chemotherapy for some time, the tumor goes down. And then after some time, we may the patient may develop drug resistance. And multiple models exist for unintervened tumor growth, but only few models can capture the effect of chemotherapy or the possibility of relapsing. So what we did is we used eight clinical trials on cancer patients published in a nature study that is available online, which contains the trajectories of tumor volumes measured over a year in patient, patients undergoing chemotherapy. And what we do using decode and uh, two steps in body regression is try to learn the underlying dynamical system from data. And what you can see is that decode is not only simpler, but also more successfully captured the relapse. It also predicts that under no further intervention, the tumor volume would keep growing, and the equations discovered by symbolic regression cannot capture uh, neither this phenomena nor the relapse in the case the patient is um, treated. Of course, we do not know what's real, and we would need to take this to uh, real experiments together with uh, biologists to be an, and clinic clinician scientist to know whether these discovered equations uh, hold true in, um, in the lab. And this brings me to the next point. Often experts, for instance, biologists, pharmacologists, clinical scientists, discover equations and dynamical systems from data. Um, here I show how machine learning can discover these uh, scientific models from data. But currently, experts do a lot of that themselves. And these are very powerful scientific models, but often they are developed in the lab using expert variables, which are not easily or routinely measured outside the lab. Conversely, in the real world, in the clinic, for instance, different variables are observed in practice and potentially very high dimensional data is observed. So an important question is what to do in settings like that where the expert scientific models are often incomplete and incorrect and may not capture all the variables or even none of the variables observed in reality in the clinic. How to bridge the gap between the science and the real world? And one powerful solution is using machine learning. And again, while I highlight here an example from healthcare, from medicine, this is generally the case because in many other domains, for instance, for some time I work on finance and also in economics, we often have powerful methods that only capture few variables. But then when we look at the complex real world, there may be a lot more variables and often the scientific models may be incomplete and incorrect. Let me anchor ideas with an example in medicine, which is a very uh, powerful real world example. We came up with this problem in collaboration with clinicians during the era of COVID. And often um, pharmacologists, which are uh, very important clinical scientists, um, are developing PKPD models. In effect, PKPD models are available for all the approved drugs on the market. And um, for instance, um, so again, PK is the drug concentration, PD is response to the drug. And often um, these PKPD models measure variables that are available in the lab, but not in the clinic. For instance, a good example is immune activation. Then in the clinic on the patient, we have different types of clinical biomarker and endpoints. And these are important for clinical decision-making. Um, and they are often not modeled or only partially modeled by PKPD models. For instance, an example is CRP or C-reactive protein. So what did we do? In collaboration, so Zhao um, my PhD student, together with a few clinicians and a, mathematic, a mathematician, uh, Professor William Zain, what we did is we proposed this latent hybridization model, which is a novel hybridization model that embeds a given expert model 
for instance, a collection of expert variables and the ordinal differential equations that describe the evolution of these variables into a larger latent variable machine learning model, such as, for instance, a system of neural ODE. So by embedding the expert equation in the system of neural ODEs, we are creating a latent hybridization model. This idea is very powerful and it can be applied in many settings. And what this latent hybridization models has, has on one hand the physiological variables described by our expert model, the PKPD model, and then there are latent variables that are learned by the machine learning model. And what we do is we are also uh, trying to, in this hybridization model, to predict and estimate using LHM the clinical variables excuse me, the clinical endpoints. So we are predicting the clinical endpoints and we are estimating the unobserved physical, physiological variables. So what LHM does is, is thereby creating a transparent model where the pharmacological equation, which is easy to understand for clinicians because they are used with pharmacological models, uh, but which uses um, variables which are not observed in the clinic. These variables are informed by the latent hybridization model. And then in addition, we to the process of embedding, we not only have um, a transparent model that now it's understood by the clinicians, but also we are inferring variables that are latent. And we are able to use all that to make powerful predictions for the individual, the patient in front of the clinician, both in terms of clinical endpoints as well as other clinical variables. So these latent variables are expert variables from the pharmacological model, which are not observed, as well as latent variables in the larger model. In this latent hybridization model, we use observational data to learn the evolution of these unobserved expert variables as well as the relationship between the measurements in the clinic and all the latent variables. Now, what's also very nice is that we can handle irregularly an informative sampling of data in the clinic, as well as static covariates, for instance, um, gender, genetic information, and other information, for instance, about comorbidities associated with this patient. And as extension, um, we are assuming um, initially that this pharmacological expert model is correct, but in practice, the model might be wrong in many ways. And the obvious way in which this um, functional form might be wrong is that it may be misspecified. For instance, we learn a linear, a linear model, which might be um, misspecified because the reality is that the complex human body is nonlinear. And what we develop in the paper is also a technique to address misspecification by integrating this into the latent hybridization model. In addition, it might be that the system of expert variables is not self-contained and the evolution actually depends on additional latent and all of these extensions can be found in our paper. Then um, what we learn is through an encoder-decoder architecture, the encoder network infers these latent variables as well as the expert physiological variables, and the decoder is a numerical OD solver. And we are training and doing prediction via an amortized variational inference, uh, approach, a conventional approach. And um, given the training data set, we use this amortized variational inference to estimate the global parameter theta and the unknown initial conditions. And I would like to note that the training procedure is agnostic to the exact choice of the variational distribution and the encoder architecture. And actually many choices are possible and a few of them are explored in our paper. What is now exciting about this is that this is a real world, um, real world work that made an impact in the clinic in the era of COVID. 
So um, early on in the UK, but also in the Netherlands, our collaborators were clinicians in the Netherlands, um, dexamethasone was approved as a drug for treating COVID-19 patients. And dexamethasone was very well uh, understood for other diseases, but it was repurposed for the use of COVID-19. Repurposing though was challenging for clinicians because if they gave too much dose, um, and if the immune system activation, which is unobservable in the clinic, and if they give, for instance, too much dose, that could lead to uh, an autoimmune problem or if too low, to slow recovery and secondary infections. So what we wanted to do is to um, use this um, expert PKPD models that were developed by pharmacologists for dexamethasone and um, determine the unobservable immune system activation for the patient in front of the clinician to enable them to understand how much medication uh, they should be giving to the patient in front of them, thereby doing precision medicine, precision dosing. So um, what we observe in the clinic is the C-reactive protein, um, but um, the PKPD model of dexamethasone is not using C-reactive protein, but rather better markers of immune response, such as a cytokine type 1 interferon, which can be measured in a laboratory, but not uh, in the clinic. However, um, what we do have is we have this very powerful PKPD model which shows how the immune response is affected by dexamethasone concentration in the lung issue. And that's again, something that we are not observing in the clinic. So the question is, if we want to empower clinicians to use this expert model, which was not discovered by DECODE, but rather by expert pharmacologists, the challenge is how really to infer from the clinical observations, this information for the patient in front of them. So what we did is um, we used the latent hybridization model to infer from data, which is um, biological um, biomarkers measured for the patient, such as C-reactive protein. And on the basis of such variables, we infer two expert variables that are not measured, such as the immune response and the dexamethasone concentration. This information is very useful for clinicians then to really understand, play with the PKPD model and decide on the basis of this how to treat patients in an uh, interpretable and powerful way. Now, you may say, is the problem solved now? Well, the reality is that not everything is unfortunately an ODE. In medicine and more generally in science, we have many types of differential equations. And for instance, we may have delay differential equations, integral differential equations, and many others. So you see here a few examples. Um, for instance, the very powerful delay PKPD models, but also we often see other types of equations, forced ordinary differential equations, stiff ordinary different differential equations, and many others. And the trouble is that not always when we observe data, we know exactly what model to use. So this may be implicit, but not known a priori. So what we did more recently is we developed a more general framework to deal with such uh, time series data in a more holistic way and in a unified way by going to the frequency domain, by going to the Laplace domain. So in this work, together with Sam and Zhaoji, we developed neural Laplace to learn a broad range of differential equations which have numerous applications and do not require the user to specify the class of differential equations a priori. For instance, choosing between an OD and a delay differential equations. And rather with the same type of Laplace neural network, neural Laplace um, network, um, the appropriate class of differential equation is determined implicitly in a data-driven way. Um, and this provides, um, this significantly extends 
um, neural ODs and also later with these Asian models. So how do we do that? Neural Laplace leverages the Laplace transform and models the differential equations in the frequency domain. And this brings two advantages. First, many classes of differential equations, including, for instance, different delay differential equations and integral differential equations can be easily represented and solved in the Laplace domain. And second, neural Laplace bypasses the neural OD solver, which is used, for instance, in neural OD, and constructs the time solution with global summations of complex expon exponentials this is shown in this graphic, and this is all very beautiful, but there is a catch. As you can see uh, in this figure on the right, the Laplace representations involve singularity points, pole points, and modeling with a neural network, um, this leads to challenges because um, we need to learn a mapping that can go from infinity to zero. And this is infinitely difficult. So how do we uh, solve this? We solve this through another mathematical trick or um, another well-known trick in the signal processing community, which is uh, we use a Riemann stereographic projection for the Laplace representations. So this is a simple projection from the complex plane to a sphere, which now is bounded. So in our neural Laplace solution, the neural network's inputs and outputs are the coordinates of this Riemann sphere, which are bounded and have no singularity, so problem solved. Um, and I will not go here into, into many details, but this is a very elegant and powerful solution and also um, achieves much better performance, um, even for scenarios where neural ODs can be used, but in many scenarios, neural ODs cannot be used. Um, and Sam has done beautiful illustrations of this. Uh, you, can, you can play with that very nicely. Now, in the very few remaining minutes, I want to talk about action and control. And if it is to talk about reality-centric AI, we don't deal with online reinforcement learning. Very often we hear a lot about online reinforcement learning. But most of the time in the real world, we are in the offline setting. So over the last 20 years, my lab has focused even more on offline rather than online RL, which is more challenging, but much more reality centric. And while reinforcement learning rely on costly trial and error approaches, um, perform either online or in simulators, but often the simulators are toy simulators because they are not readily available for real world. In contrast, offline model-based reinforcement learning learns the environment dynamics from a previously collected data set of a state action trajectory, which is often available in medicine and many other areas. And in this way, the system to be uh, learned, uh, it controls the system to a desired goal using any suitable planning model, planning method, for instance, such as training a policy or using model-based predictive control or for short MPC. In practice, we often deal with real-world environments which are continuous in time by nature and possess constant delay, whereby either the actions are not executed instantaneously or the states are not observed instantaneously. And healthcare is a good example because we often observe a treatment when giving to a patient a medication, we give the treatment, but the outcome is not observed instantaneously. It's observed with a delay. Um, so this is often uh, the case in practice, and we see this in many other environments as well, autonomous driving, satellite control, business management, etc. So this is why we build neural Laplace control now, to deal with continuous time delay systems. And this is a continuous time model based offline reinforcement learning method, which uses the neural Laplace dynamics model that I described to you before, but does planning using a model based predictive control on the basis of this dynamics model. Um, and it has numerous benefits, such as learning from an offline data set, enables planning at a longer time horizon using a fixed amount of compute 
um, has good sample efficiency, and it achieves state-of-the-art offline reinforcement learning performance. And what we do, you see in here, um, the neural Laplace control involves these three components. First, an encoder that learns to infer and represent the initial representation of the current state action trajectory up to a time t. Then in the second step, a Laplace representation network that learns to represent the solution of the state trajectory in the Laplace domain conditioned on the input state action trajectories. And it uses this stereographic projection. And then in the third step, an inverse Laplace transformation that converts the Laplace representation back to the time domain. Now, uh, this allows us to, to really do control as well. And um, it, it's a powerful solution if we want not only to understand the system, to do system identification, but also do control of such systems. What about PDEs? Because uh, we talked a lot about ODEs and families of uh, generalization of ODEs, but PDEs are even more challenging and if it is to discover um, transparent PDEs from data, the variational trick may not work. So this is what we did together with Christophe and Jaoji in this recent paper called Decipher, where Christophe, who is a mathematician by training, I really hope to recruit more mathematicians in our lab, Christophe developed some new mathematics to enable us to build Decipher, which enables us to discover closed form PDEs from data. And I will not go into a lot of the details, but um, let me just say that um, we, um, I'm going to, in view of time, go a little bit faster. And I'm going to say that we, what we did actually, uh, we relaxed some of the assumptions for variational formulation so that we can circumvent the derivative estimation um, and be more robust to noise. And, what we do in the process, um, and, and doing that was not necessarily trivial, you can find the results in the paper, but what, how we do it is um, we can remind ourselves that we use the variational trick when we did decode, and we only observe the terms with the derivative. In fact, when we look at the proof, it turns out that the terms without derivative can be as complicated uh, as possible. And this does not change whether the equation admits the variational formulation or not. So based on this observation, we propose the following characterization of PDEs. Any PD can be expressed in the following form, where we collect all the terms containing derivatives into so-called derivative bound part, and all terms without derivative into the derivative free part. And the significance of this is that derivative free part can be evaluated directly from data, whereas the derivative uh, bound part requires access to the derivatives. So if we want the PD to admit the variational formulation, we do not have to put any additional constraints on the derivative free part. However, this derivative bound part still requires some technical constraints. And we use this novel characterization of PDEs to define what we call variational ready PDEs, which are currently the broadest family of PDEs that we have shown to admit the variational formulation. So with this in mind, we build Decipher, which is a machine learning method that is able to um, learn from data PDEs. In view of time, I'll, I'll not um, go into the details, I'll briefly mention that we also needed to develop some new type of optimization method um, because we really needed to deal with constrained linear least square problems for which we um, needed to develop a method that works in tandem with our symbolic regression algorithm. The details are in our Neurips paper. Now, uh, and we are able indeed to discover from data PDEs and an advantage of that is that unlike the code where we are learning um, ODEs, which are very useful for pharmacological models, for epidemiological models, 
In many medical settings, we need to discover PDs. For instance, because we want to uh, deal with discovery of special temporal, physical or biological systems, biological models, or age structure epidemiological models. The final words are about causality. And um, while the machine learning community is very excited about causality, we want to argue that if it is to really deal with complex dynamical systems, we need to go beyond just discovering graphs and causal structure. We need to discover governing dynamics. So the ultimate frontier in discovery is not causality and causal structure, but rather governing equations. So discovering equations for dynamical systems. And if it is to deal, for instance, with treatment effects um, to determine, for instance, when to treat, how to treat in medicine and beyond, um, we can use the discovery of ODE as a causal, causal discovery mechanism. So the uh, advantage of doing that over what has been done in machine learning, inclusively my own group, which is using neural networks for treatment effect estimation over time, the advantage of using learning ODEs is that they are interpretable. They are naturally working for irregular samples, sample, um, sampling trajectories, smaller hypothesis space, and they have better performance in quite a lot of scenarios. But there are challenges associated with this because discovering an ODE is different than the treatment effects causal effect inference problem. Static features are also not considered in the ODE discovery framework. And we have different types of treatments, continuous, binary, categorical, or multiple. So how to deal with that? In a recent paper at iClear, together with Sam, Yarun, Christophe, and Zhao Ji, we created for the first time a bridge between the ODE discovery and the heterogeneous treatment effect literature for causal effect inference over time. And we did that by providing a general framework which connects the ODE discovery with the treatment effect, causal effect inference literature, and we reconcile the differences between the two. So we first explain the differences between this ODE discovery and the treatment effect inference, and then connect them in our work. And what we do is we build a first solution for it. And again, this is just a very first solution. I think a lot more, now that this bridge has been created, a lot more can be done. And in this method that we call inside, we don't use decode, but rather we use a thin D method, uh, just a very uh, simple solution from symbolic regression to do all the discovery. Um, Let's just say that what we do is we are learning uh, in our framework from the treatment effect estimated data with bias. And, and unlike in the treatment effect literature, where we learn a representation of the data and we we'll use this representation for inference, in our method, we learn an ODE defined for each specific patient in the data set. So we not only have performance, but we also have very clear interpretability associated with these governing equations. More details about this in our paper. And this brings me to the last slide of uh, my presentation. In the first part, I talked quite a lot about um, how can we use machine learning and data to discover uh, dynamical systems in the form of ODEs, PDs from data, providing humans with more insight. And then in the second part, I also described how we can use this insight and potentially additional data, like in latent hybridization models, or for instance, in neural Laplace control, to guide clinicians to select interventions um, to achieve better um, insight in treating their patients. Now, I'm very excited about the world of dynamical systems because I think it's a set of many problems that machine learners are currently um, struggling with. 
And finally, I want to remind you of this reality-centric agenda, which I think uh, is very important and often overlooked, definitely in the area of machine learning. And if you want to uh, interact not only with me, but also with my students, we have an online session um, that's open to anyone, which um, happens around once a month. We call it Inspiration Exchange, where we have uh, industry um, from a variety of machine learning top uh, companies, as well as our students discussing research and presenting research in machine learning. Um, and next time on March 11, we are going to talk about innovative ways to build uh, machine learning using large language models. Thank you.